Welcome to the Rock Newman Show. It's the Rock Newman Show. Uh, continuing in the theme of the Howard University homecoming, I have two gentlemen with me. I, ha uh, I have Darren Snyder and James Ward. I'll tell you a little more about them. Uh, in our second hour, folks, I would like for you to uh, make sure that you tell your friends and family, especially women. But you know what? I think everyone needs to hear the voice of my uh, a second hour guest, and that is Dr. Yolanda Vaughn. Um, we're gonna be talking about women, women's health issues. Um, it is extraordinarily timely uh, that we're having this discussion uh, at this hour. Uh, last night at 8.02 p.m. in North Carolina, I had a sister who made her transition. She uh, died at 8.02 last night, there in North Carolina. Uh, she had suffered for a while after being diagnosed uh, with stage four cancer. And we are fairly certain that, that uh, it was as a result of not having the proper examinations over time and that so many of the deaths and so many of the serious illnesses that we face could be helped just simply with early diagnosis. We're gonna talk about a variety of women's health issues with uh, OBGYN Dr. Yolanda uh, Vaughn in the 10 o'clock hour. And in the 11 o'clock hour, uh, we're gonna have E. Scott Bolden. In case you don't know that name, E. Let me say it, let me say it properly, E. Scott Bolden Esquire. In case you don't know that name, he's a managing partner at Reed Smith in Washington, D.C. He is the quintessential K Street lawyer in Washington, D.C. powerhouse. Much to learn from the incredible wisdom of E. Scott Bolden. So uh, we have a dynamic show for you today. But right now, the gentleman that I refer to, James Vaughn, who is at the table here with me, he is a freshman at Howard University. He is a physics major whose story really went international as this year started. James, as we found out, as was chronicled on the Today Show, Good Morning America, and magazines, newspapers, television stations throughout the country, lived as a homeless person for several years. But in the midst of that, situation. He maintained his schooling, he maintained his grades, and he maintained a commitment to excellence. He got loans, he went through various application processes, uh, grants, and he wanted to go to Howard University. He got accepted by Howard University, but in order to go to college, these, these money is involved. And he was $14,000 short. And he found a way to make his dream come true. And I think I mispronounced his last name. His name is James Ward. Um, um, James Ward, welcome to The Rock Newman Show. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you for inviting me. It's thank you so here. much, man. We're so absolutely proud of you. You are an inspiration. You are our brother. Tell us your story. Well, um... As you said before, I was homeless, and um, I was homeless throughout my my 11th grade year, actually. And during my 11th grade year, me and my family we moved into a homeless shelter. And throughout that time, I managed to stay um, stay afloat in school and keep good grades. And then I got older, and so I became 18, and I had to move out because technically I was a grown man. And so I, was mo I moved out and moved in with my grandparents. However, my mother, my sister, and my younger brother still had to um, live at the shelter. And so in the meantime, we, um, we looked for places to go. And eventually, my mother found a transitional housing program. And so we moved, and 
I went through going into my senior year, kept my grades up, applied to Howard, got in, which was, I have to say, one of the most exciting moments of my life. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the problem was affording Howard. And so I went out, got all my loans, applied for everything. And then somewhere between June and July, I found out that my PLUS loan was canceled. Your what? Your my, PLUS loan my was plus canceled? My PLUS loan was yeah. canceled. Well, I mean denied, sorry. Uh -huh. It was denied. And so um, now the problem was trying to raise the money. And so uh, I tried numerous other loan outlets, but I kept getting denied and denied. And then my mentor, Jessica Sutherland, um, asked me, is it okay if she used my image? Right. And I gave her the okay, and then she began the Homeless of Howard campaign. And the whole point of the campaign was to not necessarily raise money, but to hopefully find um, a loan provider who would be willing to allow me to take out that loan to pay for last semester, to, to pay for this semester. Right. And ended up growing into this beautiful thing that it is now. And I really don't, have, I really don't know what to say because it was a surprise to me. I think the campaign showed me how compassionate that we really are and how much people really love helping out others, although it may not seem like it, but we are very compassionate and caring people. And deep down in our hearts, all we really want to do is help other people. And I think that's what I really learned from this and that if you need help, you should always be able to reach out to your hand and ask. Well, I, I've got to ask you, let, let's stay with you just for a second here. Mm -hmm. So you were homeless. You know, so many people your age, born with a silver spoon, or certainly not anywhere close to the situation that you had to endure, as in not having a home. I mean, it's just sort of, you know, we, 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 we walk around this world, so many of us, and we don't even imagine that there really are situations where families and children like yourself don't have a place to lay their head and ultimately go into a shelter. What was it sort of in the midst of that struggle that kept you focused? What, what were your influences and, and, and what were your dreams? Um, my mother has always told me all of my life that I was going to college to begin with. Okay. And so college was never an option. Right. And so going into the situation, I knew that all because I may be in a new place, that doesn't mean that my motivation or my dreams should be deferred because I may live in a shelter now. I still have to keep up my grades because regardless if I do or not, I still need the grades to get to where I am now. And so my whole motivation is to ensure that I have the grades to get here. And even, even more important was I had to make sure that I placed the first stepping stone for my younger siblings so they can come after me and surpass me. And so I think my biggest motivation was to make my mother proud and to make sure that my younger brother and sister see that no matter what you come from or no matter how difficult you think things are, you can still succeed. And so my whole goal was to hopefully inspire them to keep going and surpass me and get to where they want to be in life. What, what, is, what was it about Howard University that drew you, that made you want to go to the capstone? Uh, it's... It's, the, it's everything. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's not one particular thing you can say about Howard University. Howard University, in my opinion, is the mecca of higher learning. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Make no mistake about that. <laughs> um, I heard somebody say one day that Howard was the black Harvard. I said, no, no, no. Harvard is the white Howard. <laughs> <laughs> there's so much to gain being at Howard. There's the experience there. The people here, there's, there's D.C., and D.C. is a magnificent place. Yeah. And Howard is just a wonderful place to be. And so there's not one, there's, you just can't pick one thing. It's just so beautiful there. I mean, when I first walked on campus, I fell in love, and I felt like this is my home, and this is exactly where I need to be. And so I plan on finishing out my four years and hopefully continuing. Oh, man. You know, to hear folks out there in live streaming land and on radio later on tonight, you know, he said, you heard what he said, Howard University felt like 
home. It feels like home, good brother, because Howard University is your home. If I can digress for just a moment, I had the great honor yesterday to, 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 to give a speech at Howard University. And part of what I incorporated in my speech was the wisdom of a professor when he talked to the 1973 soccer team that, was, that would go on to win the national title for a second time. You know, some racist bigotry of the NC2A had taken away the first title. And he talked about that there was a collection of folks that came ultimately from Africa, and the further away he got from Africa in the Caribbean and in North America, the more they lost their identity. And so it was a triangle from Africa to the Caribbean to North America. But sitting in the middle of that triangle was Howard University, connecting all back to its roots. And he really inspired that team to go on, helped inspire that team to go on to become national champions. Darren Snyder, as you sit here, mm. uh, as you sit here, Darren Snyder, by the way, has written for USA Today, Roots for, uh, writes for Root.com, the Washington Times, a very, very esteemed journalist. As you hear James talk about coming to yeah, Howard University and it feeling like home. What's your reaction to that? Well, uh, first of all, Rock, thanks for having me. And James, it's a pleasure to meet you. I know exactly what he, what he means because um, growing up in Brooklyn, New York, um, I, I really didn't know much about Howard. I thought I was going to Syracuse, New York. Then um, I was currently going, I was at the time going to Mega Evers Community College for a couple of years after high school. And then um, a professor took us to the uh, communications conference at Howard University. Yeah. And so it was my first visit that, to uh, Howard University, my first trip to Washington, D.C., since um, the sixth grade trip I took um, yeah. with my elementary school. And I got on Howard's campus, <laughs> and I looked around, and I started to learn a little bit about that history. Yeah. And I was like, this is where I'm coming. And what year was that? When, when did you come? Oh, I'm class of 85, Howard University class, class of 85. 85. So yes, you would have coming in like 81. Yeah, uh, my first year was 82. Okay. Yeah, because okay. I, I had a couple of years of college before I got here. Okay. So, okay. Uh, you know, it did feel like this is the place. And I couldn't believe that I, I was just now – be, being exposed to all of this this rich history, um, but as soon as I got on that campus and um, I saw all the people there and I started talking to people and learning more about it, it was like this. No doubt that this is the place for me. You speak of the rich history, and obviously it is, mm -hmm. as I said before, and I don't ever mind repeating it over and over and over again. It's the most important uh, learning institution, higher institution of learning mm. in the world. And it has had an incredible impact on the world. So you got there, mm -hmm. you looked around campus, you saw all of that history. Mm -hmm. It really, really appealed to you. Absolutely. And that sounds really good, and I know it's the truth. <laughs> but there's probably some more truth, too. You saw some of the oh, finest my goodness. women oh, you ever my saw goodness. in your life. And they were talking about <laughs> seven to one, brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's, that's, old, that's, that's right. old guys talking to right, right, right. you. You want you keep your head in those books. But, you know, listening to uh, James' story, it reminds me also that uh, my wife, she's a teacher at Duke Ellington School of the Arts. And, um, you know, you just don't know. People don't know what some of these kids are going through. Yeah. You know, like She has kids who are um, in shelters like James. She has kids who are dealing with um, all kinds of situations at home. And um, sometimes that's at the root of some of the struggles that these children, these kids have in schools. But it's amazing sometimes how some of them can just be so resilient and keep pushing and keep performing in spite of um, obstacles that you would think would take them out. But they just keep pressing on. And listening to this young man's story, there's just, uh, just more inspiration to, to, to show you that even though you can have challenges and obstacles, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be out. James, um you know, you, you, you come to Howard University, you, you know, you, you live in Los Angeles. Your, your, your family is there in Los Angeles. Are there any plans that you go back for Thanksgiving or Christmas or, you know, um, uh, you have to be more frugal than that and just stay here? What's, what, what's, what's, um, on the, what's on the agenda? I'm not going back for Thanksgiving, sadly. Okay. Um, however, I am going back for... Christmas. My little brother wants me to be back for Halloween and everything. He really misses how me. Old is, how old are your siblings? Uh, my sister's 14 and my brother is 6. Okay. I talk to them almost every day. And they now in transitional housing with your yeah. mother? Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll be going back for this Christmas and I truthfully, I just can't wait to see my family. Yeah. I miss them a lot. Although, 
it may not seem like it to them, yeah. but I miss them so much. Let me ask you this. Um, um, your, so you're not going back for Thanksgiving. Uh, you, you do plan to go for Christmas time. Okay. Uh -huh. um, my, um, my wife is, just has been riveted by your story. And she wanted me to talk to you, and I don't want to embarrass you sitting here on the air or anything like that. But she wanted, and I certainly supported, and you know, her wants are my wants, whether I want to, whether I want them to be or not. Um, and she wants to do something with your family, whether that is, you know, send you home at some point when you might want to go, or perhaps bring your mom and your family here at some point. That's something that just personally, that my family wants to do with and for your family. So we'll talk about that off the air. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> um, thank you. Yeah. Let me ask, um, when you got on campus, uh, quickly, did folks uh, recognize you from all the stories? No. Did not. So you were no. on you. So you were anonymous. There's you're, a lot of people who still don't. Okay. So, okay. <laughs> so you're a star in the mist, but a star nevertheless. <laughs> Folks, we'll be back to the Rock Newman Show in just a few moments. The weekend is here, and no matter what the weather's like outside, you'll find the deals inside here in the beautiful showroom of the all-new Pohanka Hyundai in Capitol Heights during their giant Markdown Madness sale. Smart shoppers know that every new Hyundai in Pohanka comes with Hyundai Assurance and America's best 10-year, 100,000-mile powertrain warranty. But why don't you tell them about the Markdown sale, Joe? I'll be happy to, Kim. Folks, shop around on the web, and you'll see lease payments on a new 2013 Elantra GLS at $179 a month. Today at Pohanka Hyundai, $99 a month. That's right, a $99 payment on a brand-new Elantra. And 89 a month on a new 2013 Accent GLS Automatic. How do they do it, Joe? It must be the volume, Kim. A brand new building, hundreds of new Hyundais, and Pohanka's low payment and easy credit programs are designed to get everybody driving. But you have to get here today. Rush to the giant Markdown Madness sale at exit 13 off the Capitol Beltway. Pohanka Hyundai, king of the Beltway. All financing for a limited term on approved HMF credit. My baby drives a Pohanka. <laughs> Hello to all my friends in the DMV. I am Rock Newman from the Rock Newman Show. I want to tell you about the MGM Grand National Harbor, the most exciting project to come to the District of Maryland or Virginia in quite some time. You're going to have great fun. Come on down, support this project with all you have. It is going to be wonderful for the area. We're going to increase our tax base. We're going to get funding for the police department, for ambulance, for fire, for education. It is really a project that is going to benefit our area. Folks, we want to support in a very strong DMV kind of way this great project from the MGM Grand National Harbor.
And now, The Rock Newman Show. Welcome back, folks. We are broadcasting from the Langston Hughes Room at Bus Boys and Poets, 14th and V Street, Northwest Washington, D.C. You can hear, hear us tonight. Tell your friends. Uh, obviously, if you're hearing my voice right now, you're watching us via live streaming. Tell your friends. Uh, they can listen to us tonight on a rebroadcast on uh, 16, 1480 a.m. That's 1480 a.m. Uh, in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. We will be uh, broadcast as we are each night, from uh, each Saturday night from 6 to 9. Uh, in studio here with me at Bus Boys and Poets is James Ward. His, his journey was titled Homeless to Howard, meaning he came to Howard University, keeping in the theme today of the Howard University homecoming. James is a freshman physics major at Howard University. And uh, Darren Snyder is a, a writer, a columnist, uh, formerly with USA Today. He's written for the Washington Times, uh, root.com. Uh, James, let me come back to you. You are a physics major. What you gonna be when you grow up? <laughs> um, hopefully an astrophysicist. I would like to work at CERN if I can. Um, I've been looking at uh, intern opportunities over the summer. And so, as of now, I just, I just want to find an internship. <laughs> you, so you said you, you want to work at CERN. Your, your, one of your dreams is to work at CERN. What's CERN? Um, CERN is actually the, um, the hydrogen collider in Switzerland. What is it? The hydrogen collider. Hydrogen, hydrogen collider. collider. Okay, okay. And, um, Can you <laughs> help explain what a hydrogen collider is? Sounds violent. Not yet. Okay. All right. All right. You on your way. You'll get there. Okay. All right. But, but, but so you want to work at this place in Switzerland, a hydrogen collider. I mean, that sounds like something that might just end the world or something <laughs> or make the world a lot better place to live. Hopefully. I, I think it will. But um, um, I either want to be an astrophysicist or a genetic engineer. And so I'm kind of split between the two as of now. And what drew you to that particular major? What, how did you develop that interest? So, going into my 11th grade year, when I was living at the shelter, I, um, a lot of the time, I spent a lot of my time either on, just on the web. Um, I watched tons of TED Talks and all over YouTube, uh, just pretty much watching physics videos without actually knowing it. Uh -huh. And then I realized that I have a love for physics because I have a thirst for knowledge. And one of my biggest things is that I would like to understand the way the universe works. And so... Realizing that, I realized that physics is where my passion and my heart lies, and so I decided to chase it. And so that's how I ended up becoming a physics major, because I felt like the only way for me to truly understand where I am in the universe is to understand the universe itself. And from there, I should be able to help those and others, and just help myself and everyone else behind me. You know what, man? I am so impressed with that, because hearing you talk, I transport myself back 43 years to when I was a freshman at Howard University. And I was really concerned about physics too. <laughs> <laughs> and, but the physics I was concerned about only was how I could get that bat off my shoulder mm. to hit that ball that was mm. coming at about 80 miles an hour. That was sort of the scope mm. of my sensibilities. And to hear you talking about doing things to identify and understand, you know, how you exist in this world, I got to tell you, young brother, that is very, very impressive. Yes, it is. You're going to be special, man. You're going to be special. Keep doing what you're doing. We'll come back to you in a minute. Darren, um, again... As a journalist, when you hear our youth mm. like James speak about his aspirations and when you hear uh, his intellectual curiosity and sensibilities and you juxtapose that mm -hmm. with how youth are portrayed, mm -hmm. oh, how our youth, how black youth much too much are portrayed mm -hmm. in so many negative ways. Mm -hmm. As a journalist, what does that do for you? Well, you know, and this is a truth that, you know, I've always realized, I don't, you know, I don't know how much everyone in uh, media would realize, recognize, or acknowledge, but the general perceptions that are, are put out there are often, you know, they're sweeping generalizations, very broad, um, strokes trying to cover or, ident or uh, 
describe, define collective groups, and you get a, you get a miss spots. Yeah. And um, you know, there's so many stories that are encouraging and inspirational and motivational and uplifting and heartwarming that never are brought to the public's attention to say like, hey, there's another side. Everyone's not out there sagging and gang banging and slinging and all of these negative things, which is the majority of the picture that's painted. Um, you know, some people say like, well, you know, bad news sells better than, than good news or um, I don't know exactly why that is, but it's definitely true in, um, in the mainstream media. So it's, it's very important that all news consumers realize that there's more to the story than, than what is being presented. And you can find all kinds of young people, you know, not necessarily with James' exact story, but just young people who are, you know, doing positive things, who are going against the trend, who are uh, really got their heads on straight, um, fighting off all of these negative influences that are out there. Because even the pictures that are painted, unfortunately, a lot of times young people, they start to believe it themselves. Yeah, sure. So, you know, they say, well, you know, everybody's doing it or no one's doing it. So they just go along with what they see as the, uh, the, the, uh, the reality of it. But it's not reality. It's a false reality. Yeah. Um, James, let me ask you. What message do you have to give to kids that are your age and younger who they sit and they think and they make decisions and they make decisions either to sort of go on a path where they don't ever actualize themselves, where they don't do the things that will make them successful? And, you know, there are others, obviously, that do. But for those who might be on the, wrong, uh, on the wrong track, if you could speak to them, what would be your message? I think that my message would be that before you make whatever choice you may make, that your choice is not only going to affect you, or it may not even affect you, but it's going to affect everyone around you. So before you decide to make whatever decision that is, just realize the implication that it's going to have on your family and your friends or even people you don't know. Secondly, if whatever choice you're going to make, if you, have, if, you have, if you feel like you're going to regret it, you shouldn't make that choice to begin with. Because when it's all said and done, if you regretted something, then you shouldn't have did it to begin with. Um, I feel that ultimately, if you feel that you're going down the wrong path or you feel that... Because you always know. You do. You really always know. Uh, if you feel like you're going down the wrong path, stop and ask yourself, what can you do and ask for help? Because there's always someone out there who is willing to help you and help you succeed and get you where you need to be or where you can be. So there's no reason for you to take that path. And so I think my overall message is just ask for help because there's always someone willing to help. Okay. So you went through this struggle. It's been well chronicled. You had, I'm sure, many disappointments along the way. You're, you know, something that you thought had been put together that was going to bring you here. It went away. You had to find yet another way to, to make this happen. So you made it happen. The day, describe to me the day that you were leaving Los Angeles to come pursue your dream. That night was a, it was a very bittersweet night. The night before? Yeah, because yeah. I left at around six in the morning, no, about four in the morning, uh, California time. And so it was a very bittersweet, bittersweet night because I'm leaving to come to Howard. However, I'm also leaving my family behind. Yeah. And so it was, it was a very emotional night because I've never been this far away from my family. And my mother had told me like, my mother told me that I was pretty much the foundation. And so for me to be gone and being her eldest child was a very precarious situation for her to find herself in. Yeah. And my younger brother and siblings aren't used to me not being there. And so this is just a huge adjustment for all of us. And so what we did to adjust to it, we, we talk a lot. And so yeah. we talk all the time 
and it's just our way to adjusting of me not being there and them not being with me. Okay, and I want, but I, I really kind of want to stay with that night for that for that family di dynamic. Did everybody cry? Yeah, yeah. I, I was in tears. Um, my mother cried. My little brother didn't cry until after I left. Mm. I think he was he was trying to show that he was a big boy. He's a strong little <laughs> man, but it was it was a sad night, but. They weren't all just tears of pain. They were sure. tears of joy because I was going on to pursue a higher education and better myself, my family, and my community to the best of my ability. And so it was, I wouldn't say gut-wrenching, yeah. but it was, very, it was a very emotionally powerful night. And so that, that whole little 10 minutes might have been, felt like forever yeah. when I was standing there waving goodbye to my family and it was just it was bittersweet you know i'm trying to be like your little brother and be a big boy and not cry <laughs> not, not cry but uh you know i lost <laughs> I, I i just lost that is such a heartwarming story okay, yes, okay. It is. so now you're on the plane tell me some things you were thinking about on that plane ride that's a long plane ride. so that was the first time I was ever on the plane. Right. And the only thing I could think of is, oh, my gosh, I'm in a giant metal tube <laughs> that's about 30,000 feet. So that physics thing took over. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I dwelled on that for about the whole ride, <laughs> unless I was sleeping. But most of the time, I was asleep. So when I was awake, the view was, it actually, it just blew my mind. It was one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen being able to look out the window and see nothing but clouds and sun rays. It was absolutely stunning. And I've never seen anything like that before. So to me, it was just, it was magnificent. I, have, I don't have words to explain yeah. the way I felt because I was sitting there looking out the window. I just left my family behind and I'm on my way to, um, to begin my own adventure and my own journey and my own life. And I felt that there was no better way to start it by looking out at something so beautiful, knowing that just a couple of months ago, it was just as dark as gloomy as my past was. Mm. Brother, if this physics Brother. thing don't work about, <laughs> don't work out, you know, a poet, I mean, you got some poetry going on up in her. Mm. <laughs> I write poetry, actually. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm, I'm not surprised to hear you said, okay, mm. I'm not done yet. Mm. So you're on the plane, you're having all of these thoughts, you're seeing this ma majesty of the universe here. You touch down, three airports in the Washington, D.C. metropolitan area, Dulles, Washington National. I don't call it Reagan. Mm -hmm. It's Washington National. That's right. And, and Thurgood Marshall, Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> Which one did you land? Where um, did you land? you remember? I think it might have been um, <laughs> Dulles or Dulles. Okay. Dulles. Right. I think it might have so been. So you, you, you touched down. Now, were there, was there, I know you said there was a, a, a friend of yours that came here. Did you come on the plane together? Yeah. Uh, okay. Me and my cousin came here together. Cousin. So uh -huh. when we arrived, his family met us. Okay. And um, they brought us back to, they took us to the campus. Yeah. And we walked into Drew for the very first time. And that's Drew Hall, y'all. Charles <laughs> Drew Hall. R. Drew Hall, blood, plasma, saved people's lives. When he couldn't go in a particular right. hospital, mm -hmm. he was the man that was helping save the people who were doctors in that hospital, but he couldn't go. Mm -hmm. Charles R. Drew, Drew mm -hmm. Hall is what he's talking about. Um, at Howard University. Mm -hmm. We got there. Today is homecoming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> H-U. Um, we got there, we checked in, found out we lived on the fifth floor, and walked into our room for the very first time. We left and instantly went and bought fans. <laughs> it was hot. It was hot. That that's, was what we call, we <laughs> that's what we call. That's what we call the dog days of August. <laughs> um, we did that. We then we went out to eat and came back and it was a Friday and so not everyone has moved in yet. Yeah. And so we actually got to pretty much explore Drew Hall together because there was no one there yeah. before it became bustling because the next morning everyone was there. Yeah. And that was pretty much my very first night. It mm. was, uh, it was, 
it was fun, I guess. What has been the most profound thing that has happened that's had the biggest impact since you've actually been at Howard? We got about a minute. Mm -hmm. I would say the most profound thing that's happened to me since I've been here would, um, I would say would be meeting the, going to, um, actually going to New York to visit the African American uh, burial ground was an amazing experience for me because it just showed me that every beginning has an end and no matter what you've gone through, there is always something there that that's pushing you forward. There's always going to be something there that's telling you to keep going no matter how difficult or how bleak the future may seem for you. And so being there and realizing and realizing and learning all these things that these people had to endure and seeing that no matter what happened, they kept their faith yeah. and their tradition and their spirit stayed strong and it allowed them to survive and thrive just meant so much to me because it, I've done the same thing. And so I was able to connect with them on not only an intellectual level, but on a spiritual and emotional level. And so I would say that's the most profound experience that I've had. You know, there's something called a Howard man. Mm -hmm. And Howard people know how to identify very quickly a Howard man. You are a Howard man. Thank yes, you, sir. brother. Yes, thank yes, you for joining sir. the Rock Newman Show. Darren, thank you so uh, much. My man. pleasure, brother. My thank pleasure. Thank you so very much. Folks, that wraps up this first hour of the, of the Howard University show <laughs> <laughs> on the Rock Newman show. Uh, we'll be back with uh, G O B G Y N, Dr. Yolanda Vaughn. Very important segment, all on women's health issues. The music you hear in the background is the Howard University alma mater. It is Howard University homecoming.